us to represent you well, to occupy until you come. And so, Lord, we invite you here. We invite you here to dwell richly in each of our hearts. And as we do that, Lord, we remember who you are. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for everything you've done and are doing and will do in our lives. And we worship you tonight. just worship you for who you are and all that you've done. We just ask tonight that you would help us to hold nothing back as we seek you and, and glorify you and help us to just surrender everything um, and just dwell in your presence tonight.
And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Shout of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And sin had left a crimson stain. He washed in white as snow. Spots and melt the heart of stone. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And sin had left a crimson stain, he washed in white as snow. the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe and sin
poor and powerless And all the lost and lonely And all the thieves will come confess And know that you You are content, and all who feel unworthy, and all who hurt with nothing left, know that you are holy. We'll know that you. Shout it, go on and scream it from the mountains, go on and tell it to the masses, that he is God, and shout Lord, and we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to shout your name and to worship you. 
And I pray that you would just help us as we, as we open your word and we, we look at who you are and, and the truth of your word, that, that we would just be receptive and listen to your Holy Spirit, Lord, and just glorify you and always say and do in your name. Amen. Amen. Blessing to have Leanne back with us. She's actually been back from Orlando. Calvary Orlando loans her to us while she's up at Newman. She's been back for a couple weeks. She got back and immediately had to self-isolate. So blessed to have her as long as the Lord would have her. Turn with me tonight to the book of Proverbs. Looks like Jim's getting Bibles if you need one. And as you turn to Proverbs tonight, it's probably worth telling you I'm breaking a rule. I'm breaking a Calvary Chapel senior pastor rule. <laughs> because most Calvary pastors, if, if, if you follow along with some of my older brothers who have been doing this longer than I have, as they teach verse by book, uh, verse by book, as they speak English and put thoughts and words together, teaching verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, book by book, an awful lot of them do Proverbs last. Not all of them, because there are some who are, are very regimented, very legalistic. You start in Genesis, you go all the way to Revelation, and, and then if the Lord allows you, do it again. But, but a lot of guys who, who, who bounce around a little bit like I do end up doing Proverbs last because it's a tough book to teach Calvary style, verse by verse, because it's not really organized in a way that lends itself to that. And so a lot of my brother pastors wait as long as they can, hoping that God will give them some divine insight or inspiration how to teach this book. I'm going to break the rule. We're going to start tonight. We need to start tonight. Because the world, you might have noticed, is going crazy. We still have, as a fellowship, even after 10 years, most of Paul's epistles, all of the major prophets, the book of Psalms, and the entire Pentateuch, that we haven't gotten into, but we need to get into Proverbs because the world is going nuts and it's only going to get crazier the closer we get to November. I said it two weeks ago, it's more true today than it was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, Kenosha hadn't happened yet. Two weeks ago, the brouhaha about what the 6% uh, statistic from the CDC means or doesn't mean hadn't hit the headlines yet. And I'm just picking two examples. Two examples that are familiar to anyone who follows the news even, even casually. And if you know about either of those things, Kenosha, the violence there, or the CDC statistics and the 6% and what that does or doesn't mean, you know that immediately upon the, the, the announcement of those things, immediately began the back and forth, the give and take, the, the, the tit for tat about what's true and what's not true. That 17-year-old with the IR-15 is a hero or a villain, depending upon who you listen to. The 6% who die either had pre-morbidities, easy for me to say, or the comorbidities happened as a result of COVID-19, or both, or neither. And we could spend all night debating either one of those issues. Is this true? Is this not true? I don't want to. And I, and I mean, I, I don't want to. I really, that, that doesn't mean wait until after service and corner me so that we can talk about it. I don't want to. <laughs> you know, the, the, the COVID-19 thing, there's, the, 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 the more that that unfolds, the more I'm reminded of Mark Twain's line. There's, there's lies, there's dad blame lies, and then there's statistics. <laughs> But see, the fact that, 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 that some of you want to argue about this stuff, you're even, that when I said I don't want to, you're like, oh, but you're going to. <laughs> Just wait until I get between you and the drinking fountain. <laughs> the, fact that, the, the, the fact that you're incredibly frustrated that there might be somebody who doesn't want to argue about this proves my point. Proves my point. In 2020, almost every new news story triggers a new battle, a battle for what's true. And that's not the first time in history that it's been like this. I majored in history. And history is like this. 
The study of history, to some extent, is a battle for what's true. You, headlines just, just a couple weeks ago, Lyndon Johnson, uh, the, 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 the champion, the advocate of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Was he a racist or was he a liberator? Or was he a little of both? Well, it's not enough to say he was a little of both. Which was more true? We, 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 we argue about truth. And in the process, in the process, the way that we're going about it as a nation, as a, as a society, we're getting further and further and further from what really is true, which is everything that George Orwell told us was going to happen. Orwell said decades ago, the most effective way to destroy a people is to deny and obliterate their understanding of history. We're living that. And to an extent, it's always been like this because, because human nature. Human nature, we want to be right. And, 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 and often that's not even enough. It's not enough to be right. We want to be more right than the other person. I posted a meme the other day, a, a Charles Spurgeon line. The Christian man cannot hate anyone. Which is true, by the way. And I didn't post it thinking that it was controversial. I didn't post it thinking I was going to spur debate. I just, I just thought it was a timely comment, something worth remembering. And people wanted to argue about it. Christians wanted to debate whether a Christian man or woman could hate someone. I mean, it's always been like this, but I think it's more like this than, than it's been for a long time. I think this season, if, if not unique, is certainly very, very much the way it is. And, 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 and perhaps unique isn't too strong a word because we're living in unprecedented times, times in which social media can spread competing versions of the truth at, at speeds not dreamt of even 20 years ago. I think that, this, that the times that we're living in, this, this season that we're in, is perhaps unique in that it's now acceptable to argue not only about what is and isn't true, but what your truth is as opposed to my truth. We live in a time where there's, where there's uh, such a thing as fake truth, or we tell each other that there is. I mean, to the point where even language has been corrupted. I don't know if you know this, in 2013, both Webster's Dictionary and Cambridge Dictionary changed or, or expanded, broadened the definition of the word literal. It used to be when you said, well, this is literally true, you meant this is factual, this is actual, this is concrete, as opposed to figurative, as opposed to, to, to poetical. Well, the definition of literal, the dictionary definition has now been expanded to include things that aren't literal. Literal can be used, I'm quoting, to acknowledge that something is not literally true, but used for emphasis or to express strong feeling. So we no longer have a word that means literal. If I say, I'm literally going to kill you, you have no idea if you should laugh or run and hide. You know, or if you're Dale, draw a weapon. <laughs> Our language can no longer distinguish between real and exaggerated. He's nodding his head because it's, it's true. <laughs> but is it literally true? <laughs> See, this is, this is the context. This is the world we're living in. A world that, in, in which I think it's imperative to seek out somehow and cling to what is actually true and what is wise. As Christians, especially in this country, but not only in this country, we've allowed ourselves to, to, to start playing by the world's rules. And, and we've allowed our, we, we, we've, we've, we've reduced ourselves to hurling insults at, at each other and at unbelievers? I, I, I mentioned to somebody the other day, and I think I actually mentioned in, in service a few weeks ago that, that the word sheeple, or the, 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 you know, the made-up word, the term sheeple, people acting like sheep, sheeple has, has, has made a comeback. 
It's in vogue again. And the, the pers- one person that I mentioned it to sent me, a, sent me a meme back saying, you know, sheep is a strange insult for Christians to use. And then sent me another note. Come to think of it, insults are a strange thing for Christians to use. We need to get back to the truth. The simple God-breathed truth and cling to it. We need to get back to it. We need to love and exhort each other in it. And and when we talk about the truth, yes, we mean the gospel. But not just the gospel. We We mean the entirety of God's word. Including, and perhaps especially in our day, those parts that specifically talk and refer to and offer to us the wisdom of God. Because Scripture has a lot, a lot, a lot to say about how to live and carry ourselves, how to conduct ourselves in this prideful, sinful, nutso world. (laughs) What I'm watching too much of the church do too much of the time is trying to outshout the world or outsnark the world trying to out-argue or out-intimidate the world instead of what we're called to do, which is out-love the world and out-think the world with the wisdom God has given us. We're called to use what's in our hearts and, and, and what's in our hands, the wisdom of God, which should make us dramatically different than the world. That's, that's my heart, and I think it's the Lord's heart behind this study. I think it's why God has us here at this time. And speaking of social media, you know how Facebook pops up memories. You know. Six years ago, I, I, I posted a quote by Alistair Begg. The challenge is always this. Are men and women going to allow the word of God to sit in judgment on our puny minds? Or are we going to make our puny minds the judges of the world? It's funny how those things have a way of being more apt when you come back to them than they were at the time. I'm starting this study, we are starting it together here. And and I have the conviction that the Lord has us here to seek his wisdom. That we could understand more clearly our world, our place in the world. And that we could better order our lives in this world world. So for the next two weeks, as we begin our study in Proverbs, we're going to allow the Lord to tell us about his wisdom. Overview. Proverbs is a wisdom book, but what does God have to say about wisdom? We're going to, we're going to take a couple weeks and just in the, in the first nine Proverbs, pull some verses that will, will frame our conversation. And then three weeks, well, in two weeks, next week, week after, in two weeks, that's where we'll really start digging in. And I said at the top of service, are we going to do 31 weeks? No, because I'm I'm breaking another rule. I'm going to cheat. We're going to do it topically. The Bible has a lot to say about parenting and marriage and speech and work and money and friendship and happiness not neatly organized by category, but, but spread out over 31 chapters. And, and there are some reasons why I think that that, that is. I, we don't know for sure. It could be that's just, you know, Solomon wrote a bunch of ideas down on the back of a cocktail napkin and put it in a folder, and then later in the days of King Hezekiah, somebody pulled out all of his notes and just kind of put them together that way. Chuck Missler has a theory that the reason that the Bible is organized or or disorganized the way it is has to do with spreading out God's knowledge and wisdom across the available bandwidth. So if any one part of Scripture were lost or unavailable to someone, if you didn't have the book of Romans, if you didn't have uh, the book of Colossians, you would lose some resolution, some clarity uh, around God's truth, but you wouldn't lose the, the, the scope of it. And, and I think perhaps that there's some, some, some truth to that. But for our purposes, I, I think it'll be fun and perhaps easier for me. 
I think it'll be better for all of us uh, if, if, if we try to, to grab some of the disparate verses that, that, that Proverbs has on various subjects, pull them together, and, and go topic by topic. And we'll see where the Lord leads with that. And, and uh, along those lines, I'm going to be handing out uh, some, some read-ahead suggestions so that when we come together on Wednesdays, um, we will have had an opportunity to look at, because it won't be as easy as we'll read Proverbs too, but to look at some of the verses that we'll be considering together. But tonight, overview. Tonight we're going to look at wisdom, what wisdom says about wisdom. Proverbs 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Proverbs is sometimes classed with the poetical books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, you'll see organized together in some commentaries. It's easy to understand why. It's largely written in verse. And it doesn't sound like verse to our ears because we're kind of used to, as English speakers, listening to, to poetry, thinking of poetry in terms of sound and rhyme. Roses are red, violets are blue, and so forth. Hebrew poetry, you might remember from when we were in Job or even Ecclesiastes, tends to be more about the point and counterpoint of ideas rather than sounds. Glance, keep a finger here, but glance down to Proverbs 22. And I'm going to give you a couple quick illustrations, just Proverbs 101. Proverbs 22, verse 1, A good name is to be chosen rather than riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. So that's one form of poetry where the first line restates the idea for emphasis on line two says it once says it again to really drive it home verse two rich and poor have this in common the lord is the maker of them all this is a little different the second line just completes the first line both of them have an idea but 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 together they have the complete thought verse three a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself but the simple pass on and are punished Line two amplifies line one either by comparing or contrasting. A prudent man does this, but the simple compare and contrast. Different kinds of Hebrew poetry. But even though that's true, Proverbs is is, is understood first and foremost as a wisdom book. And back to chapter one. That's what Solomon says is the goal of the book. Verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. The goal of Proverbs is to impart wisdom. And who better to do it than Solomon? Scripture says Solomon was wiser than all the men of Egypt And of the East. So if you're looking for wisdom, if you're looking to bring wisdom into our lives and carry wisdom into the world, wisest of all men writing about the wisest things, good place to start. By the way, not all of the Proverbs in this book were written by Solomon, even though he's writing the introduction here. Just like not all Psalms were written by David. Solomon's the main writer. He writes the entirety of chapter 10 through the middle of chapter 22. But some of them weren't collected until after his death. Some are written by others. Some are written under names like Agur and Lemuel. And we wonder, are those, are those real people, real names? Or are those pen names or those aliases that Solomon used? And scholars debate that kind of thing. But we know not all of the Proverbs collected here were written by Solomon. And not all Solomon's Proverbs are collected here. We read in Kings that Solomon wrote more than 3,000 Proverbs. We have perhaps 10% of them gathered here in, in God's Word. But the fact that these are the ones that the Holy Spirit saw fit to preserve means that it's enough to answer the, the question, what is the wisdom that we need? What is the wisdom lacking in this world? That's the question that the book is intended to answer. Proverbs 1, verse 7 Where do we start? If we want to wrap our arms, our our hearts, our minds around God's wisdom, where do we begin? Proverbs 1, verse 7, we begin with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's that compare-contrast rhyming of ideas that we were talking about. 
See, before Proverbs gives us wisdom about speech and money and business and everything else, it, it, it wants to make sure that we understand wisdom, the nature of wisdom, the source of wisdom. And the first thing this book tells us about wisdom, hey, you want to be wise? You want to benefit others? You want to know how to navigate through this world? You want to make a difference in this world? First point of your take, if you're, if you're taking notes, wisdom always begins with a right understanding of God. Absent a right understanding of God, wisdom is difficult, if not impossible, to obtain. Fear of the Lord, we understand that means reverence, not terror. Fear of the Lord, perspective, in other words. Perspective that says God is God and we, not so much. He's God and we're not. The beginning of wisdom is acknowledging that truth and choosing to have a relationship with God on the basis of that truth. God is God. I am not God. Therefore, I shouldn't try to be my own God. And I need to stop when I realize that I am. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because when I understand who I am and who he is, and who we are in relation to each other, I'm going to turn from self-centered thinking, that's all about what I do and what I want and what I think, to God-centered thinking. I'm going to start to order my thoughts and therefore my life around what God thinks. I'm going to turn from self-confident thinking, I've got this, to realizing, no, I don't. <laughs> not in my strength, not in my power, not in my wisdom. Romans 7 and 18, in my flesh dwells nothing good. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what does Christ strengthen me for? I, I, somebody sent me a photograph this afternoon. It was, a, it was a coffee mug. This is a pastor friend. I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. <laughs> I know pastors like that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what is Christ going to strengthen me to do? He's going to strengthen me to know and do his will. He's not going to strengthen me to do half-cocked ideas that Patrick thought up in his own head. When, I let, when, I, when we let fear of the Lord be the foundation of our wisdom, when we choose that, we, we turn from self-indulgent thinking, what do I feel like? What do I want? What am I in the mood for? I deserve a break today. What's that going to look like? We turn from self-indulgent thinking to God-dependent thinking. Philippians 4.19, God will supply all my needs. But how? According to the riches of his mercy. His plan done his way. God will supply all my needs. But his, his definition of what my needs are, as opposed to what my wants are. That's where wisdom begins. Solomon doesn't start off prescribing wisdom for this or that or the other. He wants us to understand the source of wisdom before he gets prescriptive. He wants us to, to root and ground ourselves in the, in the idea that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if that's where wisdom begins, that was point number one, if you're taking notes. Then point number two, that's also where it continues. Look down to verse five. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. So once we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that his word is true, that his ways are prosperous, anyone who's paying attention and isn't allowing themselves to be distracted by the bright, shiny things of the world is going to naturally seek him more and more and more. Which means part of wisdom, this is still point number two, part of wisdom is knowing the source and going back again and again and again continually to the source. Staying in the word, staying on our knees. Our tendency, and, and, and this is all of us, our tendency is to start off well and then kind of falter along the way. You don't have to think harder than New Year's resolutions. Very few New Year's resolutions live to see February. You know, paddling a boat, my daughter and I went canoeing back back in, in August. July? July. Paddling a boat, you, you know, you're going to go good as long as you keep paddling. 
lift the paddle for more than a, a couple beats and all of a sudden the boat starts to go, the canoe starts to go where the current wants to take it. I remember a, 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 a pastor telling me once, he said, be careful if, if, if you're satisfied saying, I keep my distance from the world. Well, if you keep your distance from the world, where is the world going? The world's going downhill, so that just means that you're keeping your distance on a downhill trajectory. How do we keep from drifting or, or capsizing? Wisdom says start with God and keep going back to God. I was talking to Michaela yesterday at school. I said, what's going on at school this week? She said, it's spiritual week. I misunderstood. I, I said, spirit week? You, you do that where like you dress in school colors and pep rallies and go? She said, no, spiritual week. I said, what's that? She said, it's, it's, it's you know, double chapels and classes are canceled for, for times of prayer and worship. And it's just, it's a, it's a time of spiritual immersion, you know, all the ways that you expect. And I said, you've been there like two and a half weeks. <laughs> that, that, seems, that seems soon. And she says, well, no, that, that's the theory. You know, the, the school's been doing school for a while. And what they see is that, is that people come in with ideas and intentions and prayers and plans. And after a couple weeks, com, com, complacency sets in. Because, you know, they've met their roommates. And you know where your classes are. And they're sort of a routine. And that's when they want to say, remember Jesus. Remember his word. Remember your commitment to prayer. And, and, and I, I got to say, I love that. It's brilliant because, because whether we're here or at school or at work, wherever we are, we're not pursuing wisdom in, in an inert world, in a, in a vacuum. We're not the only players on the stage of our lives. The forces of darkness are trying hard to knock us off track. Verse 10, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And that's one of those ifs like Paul uses. It's an if that really means when. When sinners entice you. Because we know that's the world that we live in. Look down to verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. We will have opportunities to grow complacent. We will have opportunities to turn back, to turn away. Satan and the world and our own flesh will make sure that there's something trying to pull us against our best prayerful intentions using all the familiar schemes and strategies that we know. They'll try to get us to deny Jesus. He's not really there. If that doesn't work, they'll try to get us to defy Jesus. Yeah, a little sin. It's not a big deal. He doesn't really care. And if neither of those approaches work, there's still another bullet in the gun. If the world and Satan and our own flesh can't get us to deny Jesus or defy Jesus, their last stand and the one that's going to get us is they'll try to convince us not to rely on Jesus. Rely on statistics, on videos, on experts, on eyewitness testimony. There's very few people today, even on social media, that are going to try to get us to renounce Jesus. Facebook algorithms are too good. Facebook knows that we're Christians, and so they're not going to fill our news feed with blatantly anti-Christian posts. Facebook's algorithms are better than that. Satan's algorithms are better than that. He's not going to come square against us. Not the kind of people who are out on a Wednesday night coming to a Bible study or, or watching online. He knows that he's, he's got a, a, a very, very thin chance at best trying to convince us that Jesus isn't real. What he's going to do is he's going to start talking about this or that or the other thing and try to convince us that whatever it is, well, that's not about Jesus. Whatever he's trying to distract us with. This political thing, this social thing, this science thing, this freedom thing. It, it's, it's not about Jesus. It's about America. It's about science. It's about the Second Amendment. It's about human rights. It's about fascism. It's about socialism. And then he'll slip it in ever so subtly. But if you say that you're a Christian, you need to believe it. 
Satan knows if you can't beat him, join him and corrupt him from the inside. And so from all directions, from within and without, we're, we're bombarded every day with, with counter-programming. Not trying to get us to deny Jesus or defy Jesus. Go ahead and love Jesus. Just love this too. Don't rely on Jesus because, because this has to be just as important. This is what's right. This is what's true. It's okay to love Jesus. Bring Jesus along. Just tell him to, to move over. Make room for me. I mean, you know, there would be even more room if Jesus would, you know, get in the back seat. Well, I, I thought we were supposed to let Jesus take the wheel. No, 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 no. Jesus drive? No, 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 no. Jesus, Jesus shouldn't drive. Jesus is driving makes me nervous. And, it's, and it, it really makes other people nervous. They might think that you're too radical. They see Jesus driving your car. That, that's going to push people away. They're not going to want to talk to you. I mean, you can do what you want, but I'm not going to ride with you if Jesus drives. And other people aren't going to want to ride with you either. I tell you what, let's compromise. You drive, Jesus can drive in the passenger seat, and I'll just kind of squeeze in between you here. Sounds appealing. Compromise. Who doesn't love a compromise? No, 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 no. God wants to drive. The country song was right. God wants to drive, and he's the only one that we should trust to drive. And he's the only one that we should trust to decide who gets to ride along. When my daughter and I were road tripping up to Minnesota this summer, I introduced her to the first rule of road trips. Concept I know you're familiar with, total driver control. Driver controls the air conditioning. Driver picks the route. And above all, Driver picks the music, that's right. <laughs> God wants to drive. And God wants total driver control. And he wants to control more than the music. He wants to control the speed, the route, the destination. And he really wants veto power over who gets to ride along. Makes even more sense if we switch the metaphor. Instead of me driving with my daughter, in, 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 in this life you're driving with your husband. Because we're the bride of Christ, right? Imagine you're driving on your honeymoon, guys. You plan a romantic getaway. Everything is going to be perfect because you factored in the smallest detail. And you're driving along on the way to this, this dream destination. Your wife wants to pick up a hitchhiker. You don't like the looks of them. But you pull over because she says pull over and, and, and you don't like the smell of them. <laughs> and as you get even closer, you definitely don't like the way he's checking out your wife. But your wife insists, we're picking him up. If you don't want to, you can get out right here. So you say, climb on in. And as the hitchhiker climbs in, he says, well, why didn't you climb into the back seat? And I'll just ride up front with the little lady here. Mind if I change the music? Sounds like the perfect honeymoon, doesn't it? But we do it all the time. But we're not supposed to. We're the bride of Christ. Just like any marriage. When we say, I do to Jesus, we're saying, I don't to anyone that would compete with him for our affection. Anyone, anything. But sin entices us. Sinners entice us. And before long, we're saying, let's have a group marriage. Let's have a thruple. It's okay to love God, but, but I should get to have other lovers. It's okay to be a Christian and, and love this and love that and practice this and be into that. God says you're not supposed to have any other gods before me or in addition to me in competition with me, but we kind of disregard that. And you're saying to yourself, Patrick, it's not the same. You're torturing the metaphor. I, I disagree. I think it's exactly the same. Why would any husband or wife say, I love you, but just so you know, I'm going to have other lovers too. I mean, I know people do that, but... <laughs> I mean, what would you say if your spouse came home from a trip or visiting family and, and said, I, I was mostly faithful? Mostly? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd give myself an A. I was gone for 10 days. I only cheated once. That's 90%. That's an A, babe. <laughs> Put yourself in that spot. I mean, I mean I'm, we're kidding, but let yourself feel that for a moment. 
Because if it's true for us, it's not going to be less true for the Lord. It's going to be more true. Because what did you do to win your bride? Flowers? Picked the right music at the right time? Got lucky with some jokes? Rem- remembered remembered the, 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 the anniversary of your first date? Remember the restaurant that she liked so much? What did it cost Jesus to win us as his bride? His life. And, and, and so the Holy Spirit cries out to us. I bought you with my blood. Let me love you. Let me help you live wisely in this life. This life that Jesus purchased with his blood. Verse 20, wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. I mean, I mean so much so that we almost grow deaf to it. Especially in the United States where there was, there's, there's Bible everywhere. On the radio and TV and internet. And there's churches and teachers and books. We get, we get numb to it. We turn it out. Even the still small voice of the Holy Spirit that's trying to teach us His ways and direct our steps and convict us when we zig instead of zagging. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do something else for a while because you'll be there when I'm done. See, the fact that God is so approachable and, and His Word is so accessible in this country, it, it can almost work against us at times. We can forget. This is point number three. Receiving more of God's wisdom is contingent on obeying the last of God's wisdom. If we want more wisdom, we have to make sure that we've heeded the wisdom we've already received. Verse 23, turn at my rebuke. Surely I'll pull out my spir- uh, pour out my spirit on you. I'll make my words known to you because I've called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand and no one regarded Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I will also laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. A couple of you in this room have told me that that you're going back and studying through Revelation with with the teachings from, I think it was 2012, 2013. And and I think we're airing Revelation on the mornings on, uh, on True FM as well. If, if, if you've been in Revelation recently or, or in any prophetic book, you're sensitive to the fact it sounds, that the passage we just read, it sounds like God's talking to who? Israel. And, and I think he is in part, and that's a whole different conversation. But, but, but if that's true, what is God holding Israel accountable for in these verses and verses like them? Same thing he's holding us accountable for, applying the wisdom we've been given. Principle that runs all through Scripture. You you, you can hardly do a Bible study without tripping over it. Obedience begets blessing. Disobedience gets us into trouble. We don't lack wisdom. We want to pretend that we do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what God would have. God promises us we'll have the wisdom that we need. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without approach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom's out there. Even when we mess up, even when we sin, and sin again, and sin for the 22nd time, or the 222nd time, God always says, come back to me. Turn back to me, and I'll welcome you again. Turn back to me, and I'll revive you again. Turn back to me, I'll guide you still. But when God says, turn back to me, he means, turn back to me, and turn your back on whatever you were into that wasn't me. Turn away from whatever you had yourself turned toward that had you all turned around. Repent of whatever sin or sinner or idol or anything that that you were into. Be done with it. Don't decide to be done with it. Oh, I've decided to be done with it. I've decided to follow Jesus. No, no, no. Be done and follow Jesus. Whatever it was, kick it out of the car. Don't slow it down. Just push it out. Don't give it $5 for a hamburger. Don't give it a quarter to make a phone call. Renounce it, reject it, and run away from it. God says, do that, and I'll give you more wisdom. Until you do that, I don't know if you're serious or not. 
until we act on the wisdom that we already have and go back to where we were when we started with the Lord, who's the beginning of wisdom, until we get back to, okay, he's God, I'm not, until we remember the Lord is where I return for wisdom, or, or better, continue in wisdom, until we act decisively on the basis of that most foundational wisdom, we're not going to get more. What we'll get is what, whatever consequences were due from whatever bad decision we made without the benefit of God's wisdom. Anne and I have a great relationship. One of the, one of the best things I have going for me as a pastor is, 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 is not my knowledge of the word or, or, or my devotion to the Lord. It's I've got a great wife. We very rarely fight. Two things will change that. We cannot... And this has been proven true in four states. We cannot move furniture together. And the other way, a sure way to get into a fight with my wife is if I ask her for directions while I'm driving. And her nickname in our old church was AnQuest, as in MapQuest, because if she's been someplace once, she can find her way back there. It is really annoying <laughs> if you're like me and you can get lost in a parking lot. And, and see, this doesn't come up much anymore because, you know, Siri. <laughs> now I can ask Siri, but before Siri and smartphones, it wasn't unusual for me to get lost. It was actually unusual for me to not get lost. And when I'd get lost, I'd call Ann and say, hey, get me unlost. So I'd be, you know, in Philadelphia, and, and I'd say, okay, I'm lost, and I need to get to the place where I'm going, and she'd say, where are you? I'm at 8th and Walnut. Okay, turn right on Market. Yeah, I already passed Market. Thought you were at Walnut. Yeah, the light changed. Okay, turn right on Arch. Yeah, past Arch too. Okay, what you want to do? So hey, wait, just I turned right on Cherry. Yeah, don't do that. You said turn right. I turned. I turned. Cherry's a dead end. Yep. Yep, I see that now. <laughs> so do I turn left or right? You can only turn left. Oh, that's okay. I made a U-turn. Now, now, which way do I go to get to Arch? And this is usually when she would say, I can't help you if you keep moving. Pull over, stop the car, pull, turn the car off, and call me back. <laughs> Siri says the same thing. She's just nicer about it. <laughs> Siri just says, recalculating. <laughs> and God says the same thing. God says, you want wisdom? You want guidance? You want to know how to navigate a twisty, turny, strange, painful, dangerous world? I'm here to help. I know how to get where you're going. But don't invite me along for your ride. If you want my help, let me drive. Let me navigate. And if you decide you want to drive and you decide that you're going to make turns and you get yourself lost, the next thing you need to do is stop what you're doing. Stop getting more lost and help, let me help. Ask me what to do next. Because if not, verse 28, if not, there'll come a day when God says that they'll call on me, but I won't answer. They'll seek me diligently, but not find me. Because they hated knowledge and didn't choose the fear of the Lord. They'd have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. God offers us wisdom. It's up to us to decide what to do with it. If we persistently ignore his wisdom, should we be surprised when he hangs up the phone and says, call me back when you're ready to listen? Because <laughs> sometimes that's the most loving thing he can do. When do I pull over in Philadelphia? When Ann stops giving me directions on, on my terms and tells me she'll help when I'm ready to, to pull over and listen and let her help on her terms. And, and, and she doesn't scream. She doesn't threaten. She doesn't say, okay, when you come home, you're sleeping on the couch. She just waits. She's Christ-like that way. When we insist on going our way, relegating God to the back seat or, or, or pushing him out of the car, comes a point where he just stops fighting. Comes a point when he says, call, he says, call me back when you're ready. I'll wait. 
He always offers a way of escape, but usually repeatedly. But after a while, hey, call me when you're ready to listen. Call me when you realize you've driven into a really bad part of town and you need help now. Then when he has our attention, Proverbs 2, verse